ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب اليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين اما بعد today inshallah ta'ala the reflection and what we're going to ponder over and contemplate over is the hadith a very powerful hadith which if you look at the books of the scholars especially books pertaining to aqidah when it comes to the books that talk about masailu al-iman issues pertaining to iman you will always find this hadith in there like for example if you look at the kitab kitab al-iman li ibn manda rahimahullah and the book kitab al-iman written by shaykh al-islam ibn taymiyyah he has two books al-iman al-kabir and al-iman al-awsat and if you look at the kitab ta'zim qadr as-salah written by muhammad nasr al-marwazi and other books you will always find this hadith is mentioned a lot and this hadith is very well known as the hadith of wafd abdul qais inshallah ta'ala my aim is to extract 20 benefits from this particular hadith inshallah ta'ala first of all i'm going to go over the hadith with you all and then we're going to extract the 20 benefits from the hadith inshallah ta'ala one after the other abdullah ibn abbas narrated this hadith and this hadith can be found in Bukhari and Muslim. Abdullah ibn Abbas he said, In the wafda Abdul Qaisi Lama Atawu Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the delegation of the tribe of Abdul Qais came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet said, when, he, when they came to him, the Prophet said to them, Mani al Qawm, O Mani al Wafdu. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Who are the people? Who are you guys? And who are the tri- um, who are these delegation that has come to me? Qalu, they responded by saying, Rabi'a. The response that they gave to the Prophet is, We are Rabi'a, a tribe, the tribe of Rabi'a. That's who we are. Qala, then the Prophet said to them, Marhaban bil qawmi. أو بالوفد غير خزايا ولا ندامة. The messenger said, "Welcome, O people." Or the narrator said, "He said, 'Welcome, O delegation of Abdul Qais. Neither will you face disgrace or regret." Then they said to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, "فقالوا يا رسول الله أو messenger of Allah, إن لا نستطيع أن نأتيك." O Messenger of Allah, we are not able to come to you illa fi shahr al-harami except in the sacred months. Ashmur al-hurum, the sacred months which the disbelievers never used to fight. That's the only time that we can come to you. Wa bainana wa bain kahad al-hayy min kufari mudar. And between us, O Messenger of Allah. There is the infidels, the disbelievers, the tribe of Mubar, the people of Mubar. They intervene between you and us, O Messenger of Allah. Famurna bi amri faslin. Famurna, command us, O Messenger of Allah. Instruct us, please order us something good to do. Nukhbiru bihi man wa ra'ala. That we can go back to those who we left behind, and we can inform them of what you told us. And it could be a means for us to enter Jannah. Then they asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what are the types of liquid that we can drink? What kind of things are we allowed to drink? What is legal and what is illegal? The types of drinks. Then the messenger said, "Fa'amarahum bi arba'in." The Prophet commanded them good, "Wa nahahum an arba'in." 
وَنَهَاهُمْ عَنْ أَرْبَعِنْ And he prohibited them. He prohibited them from four things. أَمَرَهُمْ بِاللَّهِ أَمَرَهُمْ He commanded them بِالْإِمَانِ بِاللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ He commanded them to believe in Allah alone. Then the Prophet said to them, أَتَدْرُونَ مَا الْإِمَانُ بِاللَّهِ Do you know what it means to believe in Allah وَحْدَهُ alone? قَالُوا They responded by saying, الله ورسوله أعلم الله and his messenger know best قال then the prophet said الإيمان means إيمان is شهادة أن لا إله إلا الله that you bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah وأن محمد رسول الله and that نبي الله محمد is the messenger of Allah وإقام وإقام الصلاة and that you establish the prayer أما وإقام الصلاة you establish the prayer. وَإِيْتَاءُ الزَّكَاتِ And that you come with zakat. وَصَوْمُ رَمَضَانِ And that you fast the month of Ramadan. وَأَن تُعْطُوا And that you give مِنَ الْمَغْنَمِ The spoils of war and the booty. الْخُمُسِ Fifth of it. وَنَهَاهُمْ عَنْ أَرْبَعِنْ And the Prophet, he prohibited them from four things. He prohibited them from what? Al-Hantami, Wal-Dubai, Wal-Naqiri, Wal-Muzaffati, Wa Rubbama Qala Al-Muqayyari. Those four in which he prohibited them from, alayhi salatu wassalam, they were pots, they were pots in which the Arabs used to drink alcohol from, which they used to prepare alcohol from. Then the Prophet said to them, Ihfadu hunna, Memorize all of this from me. وَأَخْبِرُوا بِهِنَّ And inform these two مَنْ وَرَاءَكُمْ Those you have left behind. This hadith, as you can see, it has a lot of benefits in it. And it's great that we give our times to understand this hadith. This hadith is going to teach us many lessons. And my beloved brothers and sisters, as you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Taraktu fikum, I have left between you all. I have left with you all. Shay'ayni, two things. Lan tadillu ba'dahuma, you will never be misguided after those two. What are they? Kitab Allah, the book of Allah is what I left with you. Wa sunnati, and I have left my sunnah with you. Anyone who holds on to those two will never be misguided. And destruction will come his way. So it's important that we give time out to understanding the hadith of the Prophet. Because in it is our salvation and our prosperity. This hadith, as I said before, is very well known as Hadith Wafda Abdul Qais. It's a hadith which is Adim al The benefits that are in it are great. And inshallah ta'ala will extract one benefit after the other. Because the reason why this hadith deserves for us to stand over is that what these, what the delegation asked the Prophet for was what? Something that will allow them to enter what? Jannah. And so the answer that the Prophet gave them is something that's going to take them to what? To Jannah. And isn't that what we want? So let's stand over the hadith, the benefits that are in it, and the dalalat, the indications, and the wordings and what the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam. Al-fa'idatul ula, the first benefit that we can take from this hadith is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he placed in the visitors that came to him, he placed in their hearts love and he placed in their hearts a passion alayhi salatu wasalam. The reason why he did is he tried to get to know who they are. Find out about them. So he knows them when he sees them next time, alayhi salatu wasalam. So he can place them in their right place. Give them their due rights. Because when you know somebody, you are able to place them in their right place. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, he commanded, as Aisha said, and nunzil al that we place the people in their true places. So the Prophet said, Who is the people? Who are you? 
Oh, man al Waft, who is this delegation? He showed that the Prophet wanted to know who they were. So this places in their heart that the Prophet asked about them. And that the Prophet wanted to know who they were. So that's the first benefit that we take from. When you meet a person, don't just answer their question. Always try to make sure that you find about their name. Who are they? Get to know them. And then answer their question. And try to remember when you see them next time who they are. Al Fa'ida al Thaniya. The second benefit that you can take from the hadith is the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he made them feel he made them feel alayhi salatu wasalam that they're in his company. He didn't make them feel lowly. The way he didn't do that alayhi salatu wasalam is by saying to them marhaban welcome. The fact that he said to them welcome shows that he's made them one of his companions and he's brought them in. The fact that he used that term makes them feel welcomed. So he said to them, Marhaban, welcome. And this is something a person should try to do. That when a person comes and visits you in your house, that you tell them this house is your house. You're welcome. Enjoy your time. Enjoy your stay. These words of comfort, comfort, it brings a ta'nis al-qadim. The person who's coming, he feels that this place is for him. And this is min manhaji and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet's methodology, that when you come to a gathering, when you come to a masjid, that you feel welcomed. If you come to a masjid, and as soon as you walk in, you're scrutinized. Who are you? Where are you from? Who do you take knowledge from? This is opposing what the Prophet was upon. And this opposes the Prophet's way, alayhi salatu wasalam. The Prophet, as soon as he mentioned, saw the delegation, they felt home. He told them, Marhaban, welcome, alayhi salatu wasalam. So this is very important that you're like this. Al-Fa'ida. Al-Fa'ida to Tharitha. The third benefit that we take from the hadith is that you can refer to yourself as a whole when you're just part of something. Al-Ta'biru al ba'di bil kulli. You can use something that shows that you're speaking as your everything of it, but you're only part of it. And the evidence for this is that when the Prophet said to them, Manil Qaw, who are you? Or when he said, Manil Waft, who is the delegation? They responded by saying, Rabi'a. And Rabi'a is a tribe, and they are only part of the tribe. They are not all of Rabi'a. So if a person comes and says, I am Somali. That doesn't mean he's all of Somali. He's a part of it. That ta'biru anil ba'di. Using um, as though you're the whole, but intending only part of it, is what we take from the hadith. Which the ulama of linguistics, I mean the ulama of balagh eloquency, sorry, they say, dhikru al ba'di wa iradatul kulli. And sometimes you mean you say bit but you intend the whole and sometimes you say the whole but you intend some al faidatul rabi'ah the fourth benefit that we take from the hadith is anybody who takes the path of guidance anybody who takes the path of guidance and looking for the truth that he will not go through disgrace or regret a person who takes a path where he wants to be guided and he wants to gain the truth, he will not achieve and he will not endure khiz wala nadama. He will not go through disgrace in this earth, inshallah. Nor will he go through regret. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he say? غَيْرَ خَزَايَا wala nadama. And the ulama, grammatically, they, were, they say, غَيْرَ is mansub عَلَى الْحَالِ Grammatically, the word غَيْرَ is mansub, And it's mansub as a hal situation, a hal. 
Meaning marhaban bil qawmi Welcome people Wal hal And the situation is that An lakum ghayra khazaya wa la nadama That upon you is no disgrace or regret What were these people's intent And why did they come They wanted to know the truth They wanted to know guidance That was their aim That was their objective And the Prophet told them The fact that they have tried to do that Allah is not going to disgrace them Nor is he going to make them Go through regret And this is for everybody Who is serious about knowing the truth Who seriously wants to know his religion Allah will will not disgrace him Nor will he subhanahu wa ta'ala Nor will he uh, Make that person regret it Rather the opposite is the truth Allah raises the station of the people Who want to learn the religion As he said in the Quran يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah raises their ranks and their position Subhanahu wa ta'ala Al-Fa'idatul Khamisa The fifth benefit that we take from this hadith is جَوَازُ الثَّلَاء That is permissible to praise somebody It is permissible to praise a person في وجهه in front of him إِذَا أُمِنَ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْفِتْنَةِ if you're safe from any fitna occurring, that you can. But if the fear comes that this might cause this person something, then you shouldn't praise the person. And in the famous hadith is what? Praising is what? Adhabhu is slaughtering somebody, it's killing somebody. When you praise somebody in their face, you're actually killing them. But that is when you fear that this might cause the person something bad, or it might be do something bad to the individual. Because what did the Prophet ﷺ do? Because he said to them, You're not going to go through with disgrace. Allah is going to raise you guys. You're raised. He praised them. So in it is what? Athana. The fifth, sorry, the sixth benefit that we take from the hadith is what? That this delegation, their Islam was before they came to the Prophet ﷺ. They were Muslims before that. And that this delegation is the best delegation that ever came. And they were the first delegation that came to the Prophet ﷺ. The seventh benefit that we take from the hadith is what? That guidance is in whose hands, brothers? And the amr al-hidayat biyadillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala Guidance is in Allah's hands Allah guides whoever he will subhanahu wa ta'ala How is that the case? And how do we benefit that from the hadith? The wafda abdil qais Between them and the Prophet was which tribe? Kufar mutar Were between the Prophet And the Wafda Abdul Qais, they were closer to the Manba'ul Wahi, they were closer to the revelation, they were closer to the Prophet's land. Abdul Qais, Wafda Abdul Qais, they were more further from the Prophet. And the guidance came to them. The guidance didn't come to the who? The people of what? The Qabila, the tribe of Mudar, the Kufar of Mudar didn't accept Islam. Lakin, the wafd of Abdul Qais, they accepted al Islam, even though they're further. And this teaches us, أَفَمَنْ شَرَحَ اللَّهُ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ فَهُوَ عَلَى نُورٍ مِنْ رَبِّهِ That anybody who Allah opens his chest, Allah opens it subhanahu wa ta'ala for Islam, فَهُوَ عَلَى نُورٍ مِنْ رَبِّهِ is upon light from his Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That guidance is in whose hands? It is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands. He guides whoever he wills. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The eighth benefit that we take from the hadith is No, it's eighth, right? Huh? The brothers were writing. It's the eighth hadith. They were writing. No. Eight, huh? Eight. Eight. Is it eight, Akhi? 
Ijma'ah. Because those four were writing. I don't see anyone else writing. Is it eight? <laughs> no, you say it's eight. Al Fa'idatu Thamina. The eighth benefit that we take from the hadith is the importance of perf- perfecting your intentions when asking questions. And that is, these individuals, when they asked the Prophet وسلم, why were they asking the question? And what was their reason to ask the question? Their reason was, Murna bi amrin. Command us, order us, O Messenger of Allah, bi amrin faslin, a cut, clear cut matter, a the action and righteous deeds that we can come with. So, who were they asking for? Who is it that they wanted to know this for? For somebody else? Their intent was for themselves. And nowadays, some people will come to an alim, a scholar. Allah has blessed them and gave them the opportunity to sit with a sheikh. And the sheikh is in their gathering. Instead of asking them something that's beneficial for you, something that you can benefit from, a good that you could leave with, what would that person do? They are jumping to ask for other people. They ask questions that, that are no benefit for them. They even may ask the question just to show the people, look how I'm giving the sheikh a hard question. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said in the hadith, مَنْ طَلَبَ الْعِلْمَ لِيُجَارِي بِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ أَوْ لِيُمَارِي بِهِ السُّفَهَاءِ أَوْ يَصْرِفَ بِهِ وُجُوهَ النَّاسِ إِلَيْهِ أَدْخَلَهُ اللَّهُ النَّارِ Anybody who tries to attain knowledge and his aim for gaining knowledge, asking question, is so that he can put the scholars down. So look, he doesn't know. See, he's confused. My question confused the Sheikh. That's why he's asking. Or he's asking the question to show the people he knows something or he wants to bully the people through his knowledge and he wants to mock the people that's the purpose in why he's learning the prophet told us alayhi salatu salam that that person the knowledge that they've taken will only be a way to hellfire like he wafda abdul qais their question was for who they said murna command us or message of Allah, order us what? The Amr in Fasilin, a matter which is kareka, which is to the point that commands us and orders us that which we need to come with. Look how they wanted something for themselves. And then look what they said after that. Nukhbiru bihi man wara'ana. And then we can take that information. After we've implemented it, we can take it to who? Those who we've left behind. jannah. And this can be a means for us to enter Jannah. This is why they ask the question, Allahu Akbar. This is what? This is why they ask the question. One brother, he said to me once, when he graduated, I asked him one time, what was the best advice? He graduated from the Jamia Islamiyah, Jamia Medina, he graduated from it. So I said to him, when you left the Jamia, what was the best advice? I mean, what was the, one of the best advices that was given to you? And who, was, who gave you the best advice? And he said the best advice was given to me by Sheikh Abdul Razak ibn Abdul Muhsin al Abad, the son of the great scholar Abdul Muhsin's son Abdul Razak. So I said, What did he say to you? He said to me, When I finished the Jamia, he said, Make sure that all that you learnt, you learnt it based on the questioning of the wafda of Abdul Qais. The purpose you learnt it is that. Your intent was for it to be a guidance for you yourself. And now that you're departuring and that you're leaving to go back to the United Kingdom, and that you convey this message to those you've left behind, and you can guide them. And that he said to him, and it's also the knowledge that you've attained, you always remember, that it's a path for you to enter Jannah. The brother, that's what the Shaykh said to him. Ya laha min nasiha. What is more greater than that advice, Wallahi? The one who takes it like it. The Shaykh spoke from a very powerful point. The Shaykh mentioned this to him. Hafidahullah ta'ala.
The ninth benefit that we take from the hadith is Ibda'i al-Udri Coming with an excuse عند العجز When you're unable to come to a place of khair When you know you couldn't attend a lesson And you were absent And you missed a class Don't pretend like nothing, nothing happened Hasten to the minute you lay eyes on your teacher To straight away give him a excuse of why you were absent The minute they met the messenger And they saw the prophet They didn't say anything to him except Inna la nastati'u message of Allah We are unable to come to you And na'tiyaka illa fi shahri al-haram Except to come to you in the sacred months We can't come to you except the sacred months Wa baynana wa baynaka And between us and the mess- or messenger Between us and you or messenger of Allah Had al-hayy min kuffari mubar Is the people and the tribe of mubar The Arabs they used to have this way which is that a tribe cannot move and maneuver through another tribe unless it was the sacred months or else you, they will wage war on that tribe and they will fight with them so the only time that the tribes can move through each other was that sacred months Ashwarul Hurum so look how they straight away came to the Prophet and they gave him their reason why they can't participate in the lessons and that they can't benefit from him and this is the etiquette that a student of knowledge needs to have which is called taqdeem udr that you bring forward an excuse a legitimate excuse of why you couldn't make it to the class and why you couldn't participate in the khayr and these companions this delegation they had a very valid excuse did they not? because if they tried to move through the people of mudha they will kill them they will kill them so what is the mafhum? What, what is it that we understand from their statement is if the people of Kufar and Mudar were not in that place, we would have been there with your message of Allah. And we would have been those who attain knowledge from you. The tenth benefit that we take from this hadith is al muhim. That when you ask a question, you start with that which is most important for you. Don't ask what is less important. Start with what is most important to you. This is what is from the etiquette of a student of knowledge. This is the etiquette of gaining knowledge, that you start with what concerns you, what is important to you, what you need as an individual. Start with yourself. I ask you brothers, look at the Quran. Every time you see the prophets make dua, who do they start the dua for when they make the dua? Rabbi, firli. Wali, who do they start with? So everyone should swat for themselves. Like the hadith Al Imam Abu Dawood narrated in his Sunan, which is what? Kana Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ila da'a. That the Prophet was one that if he supplicated, Bada bin Afsi, he will start with himself. Attaining knowledge is a path to Jannah, it's a path to gain guidance. It's a path to what? It's a path to gain guidance. Who should you first want it for? First want it for yourself. So when you ask question, first of all, start with your questions first. What is most important for you? What is it that you need most? Ask those questions in that order. Even your questions that you have, ask them in the order of importance it is and place it in that sequence. Start with what is what? Bisu'ali anil ahammi thumma al-muhim. The most important, second in order, third and fourth. Look what they said. فَمُرْنَا بِأَمْرٍ فَصْلٍ نُخْبِرُ بِهِ مُمَّنْ وَرَعَنَا Give us a click and matter. Command us. That then we can take that information to who? Those we've left behind. وَنَدْخُلُ بِهِ الْجَنَّةِ And we can enter Jannah from it. وَسَأَلُهُ عَنِ الْأَشْرِبَةِ And what was the first question they asked? They asked about drinking. What are they allowed to drink and what, what are they not allowed to drink? That was the most important question for them. The eleventh benefit that we take from the hadith, inshallah ta'ala, is the importance of giving da'wah, brothers. And how it is important to give da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's way. And how it's important, especially in a community and a society like today, to guide the people to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The delegation 
even that though they started with what was beneficial for them first, they didn't forget the importance of those who they left behind and guiding others. And I always mention the line of poetry, فَلْتَقْصِدُوا أَرْبَعَةً قَبْلَ ابْتِدَى تَعَلَّمْ لِكَيْ تَفُوزَ بِالْهُدَى أَوَّلُهَا الْخُرُوجُ مِنْ ضَلَالِ وَالثَّانِ نَفْعُ خَلْقِ ذِي الْجَلَالِ وَثَالِثُ الْإِحْيَاءِ لِلْعُلُومِ وَالرَّابِعُ الْعَمَلِ لِلْمَعْلُومِ أَوَّلُهَا الْخُرُوجُ مِنْ ضَلَالِ The first reason why you want to gain knowledge and you want to learn is to leave misguidance. You don't want to be an ignorant person for the rest of your life. والثاني نفع خلق ذي الجلال and the second reason why you are attaining knowledge and you want to learn is you want to benefit those who are around you and your community and the people around you so those are the two main I mean the two first reasons why you attend and you gain knowledge <coughs> which is to give da'wah is to convey that message a person studies for six years, seven years, graduates from a prestigious university, comes back to this country, the first thing that they should make their aim and objective is to give da'wah. A da'wah to Allah Ta'ala. They shouldn't look for a nine to five job. They shouldn't be a bus driver. Should they work? Of course they should work. Should they get a job? Of course they should get a job. Should they study academic studies? Of course they should study academic studies. But da'wah should be part of their time. Da'wah should be what? part of their schedule that they are known to give da'wah and call to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I'm sorry what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say wal asr Allah swore by time innal insana lafi khusr the very mankind is all upon what loss and then Allah tabarik wa ta'ala he gives istithna an exception what's the exception here illa alladheena آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا. So what is it that we take from it? That the people who are not going to be lost are people who come with four characteristics. Anyone who hasn't got these four characteristics, he's considered from the people who are upon loss. Who is it? إلا الذين آمنوا those who gain beneficial knowledge وعملوا الصالحات who come with righteous deeds. وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ They call to good. وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ And they come with patience. If you don't have those four, you're in a state of loss. And it's all four of them have to be with you. الْعِلْمُ النَّافِعِ وَالْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحِ وَالْدَعْوَةُ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَالصَّبْرُ عَلَى الْأَذَى فِيهِ That you have benefit, you gain beneficial knowledge. You come with righteous deeds. You call to the way of your Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fourth one is, you are patient in the harm that you go through when you are calling to the path of Allah. And you are also patient when you're implementing the knowledge. And you're also patient when you're attaining the beneficial knowledge. If you don't have those four, you fall under in al insana lafi khusri. You're upon loss. The only thing that can take you out of the loss is by coming with these four characteristics. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said in the Quran, He said, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika, call to the path of your Lord. And the command in the Quran shows obligation. وَلِذَلِكَ دَ ulama they mention that the Muslims are not allowed to stay in the land of the disbelievers Except with the condition that they are what? That they are dua to Allah. They are according to the path of Allah. That's the condition that the ulama stipulated. After doing tatabbu al istiqra, following up the what? Following the Quran and the Sunnah, they came with that this is the condition if the Muslims want to stay in the land of the disbelievers, that they are dua. That they are according to Allah's path. Now many people think to be a da'i means you have to wear a particular uniform, you have to be uh, registered from a particular masjid, and that you have to be... No, it doesn't mean any of that. You can be a da'i in your job. You can be a da'i whilst you're driving your taxi. You can be a da'i to your next door neighbor. 
You could be a da'i in your 95 job that you go to. You could be a da'i in your university that you're in. The classmates, the people who go to your class. All of these are places you can be given da'wah. Whilst you're, you're coming into contact with people who are not Muslims. The da'wah is also not restricted to the disbelievers. You also give da'wah to the believers. But the way that the person gives it, brothers, is bil hikmati wal mawirati al-hasana wa jadilhum billati hiya ahsan. In this ayah, Allah tells us that the people you give da'wah to are three types. The people are three types. One type of people is al mawirah. They need a reminder. Their heart is alive, but it keeps going down and it dies. They just need that remembrance, a reminder. So mawirah, just a reminder, heart softener, they're back again. Another group of people, sorry, hikmah. Those just need wisdom. Sorry, the ones whose heart is alive, they need wisdom. Maybe they just need you to take them out to Costa. They just want to have a cup of tea with somebody, and you just doing that for them is maybe a way to do it. Wisdom in your way you approach their issue. Another group of people is al mu'ida, reminder, with the hikmah. Ibn Qayyim says. That you give a mu'ida, a reminder, and you use a nice, wise way. Sometimes you come from the angle of gifting them something, sometimes this, something, sometimes there, and a reminder in it. Come, let's go to the, visit the graves today. Or go by a place where the graves are at and say, look at this, till one day this could be you. If you want to give them something, say, Akhi, how about you visit hikmah? Akhi, come with today, inshallah ta'ala. I want to take you out for a food. Okay, okay, mashallah. Come visit me at the masjid at Dhuhr. You're bringing him into the masjid for Dhuhr, Jama'ah. Hikmah. You're thinking. So he comes, because he wants the food. Sah? So he comes into Dhuhr time, into the masjid. He prays Jama'ah, and then you take him out. You don't meet him on the street, on the corner. You're using wisdom. You want his heart to wake up. Or you say, how about meeting on Jum'ah? You use a Hikmah with him and Mu'ibah. If you know your wife doesn't listen to you مثلا, when it comes to reminders and heart softening or you know your parents don't listen to you maybe they listen to a sheikh that you, that you know of buy that tape for her make a cassette for them maybe she listens to, maybe your wife might listen to another speaker another lecturer hikmah and wisdom is the way you go around it and the third type of person is another person who is argumentative this person you argue, argue with them and you debate with them in that which is good. If the person is al khisab, he just debates for the sake of debating, they don't waste your time with them. And if you look at today, the Muslims today, especially if you watch those who go to Hyde Park, they don't distinguish between those three types of Muslims. And they don't distinguish between the three types of audience. Not every single Catholic wants from you to debate, does he? Some of them actually just want somebody to take them out from uh, coffee. Some of them just want wisdom. And good manners and just your actions and just that can bring them into Islam and etc. Right? But if you make every type of disbeliever that you talk to argument, okay, let me discuss this issue with you. And you debate with him straight away. Why have you pushed everybody to one category? Are we together? I'll conclude there, inshallah ta'ala, for today. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect or fault or mistakes or errors is for me and Shaytan and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illallah astaghfiruk wa atubu